What's up? This is Derek Fiedler, and in this video, we are going to dive into the deeper meaning of episodes two, three, four of Queen of the Night, the sci-fi silent film by Dirt Poor Robbins. Let's break down each episode, summarizing the plot and pointing out the symbols, Easter eggs, and backstories as we go. At the end, I will provide a short analysis of the episodes, as well as look ahead to the finale. I'll give my predictions and things to look out for in episode five. We have a lot to uncover, so let's get started. Episode two, An Electric World. Now an adult, Graves rides in the Hindenburg-style airship, admiring Graves Tower, standing high above everything else in Great City. The airship is in the shape of a Capricorn, has the head of a goat and the tail of a fish. We see Capricorn imagery throughout these episodes. Uh, Graves has leveraged the power of the Capricorn scale to erect a technocratic metropolis. We also see the other symbols of the sea and the airship, continuing the sky-sea parallels, uh, the depths and the heights and the heights and the depths. If we were to take a look at the newspaper that Graves is reading, we can pause the picture before it blurs. We find loads of Easter eggs and plot details. There's a reference to Jules Verne, the author of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and the Journey to the Center of the Earth. We find out that the city is hinging their future on Graves and his power web perpetual energy. Graves is offering the energy for the whole city for free for the first year and just pennies a year after that. As we know, free always comes at a cost. The ship lands at the top of the tower and Graves enters the office. It's here that we meet Graves' assistant, Freya, who pesters him with practical matters and McTavish, Graves' muscle, his right-hand man. We also see a cameo by musician Pete Mitchell as Biscuit Boy Number 2. Pete and director Neil DeGrade were in various projects together, including the band No More Kings, whose song Sweep the Leg inspired the Karate Kid reboot Cobra Kai. Graves entrusts McTavish to, to secure the box concealing the Capricorn scale. McTavish peeks at plans on Graves' desk, showing designs in the tower for what looks to be a hidden rocket ship inside of the structure. Uh, Graves asks Freya about his personal project, to which she responds with a disheartened disposition, saying, Everything is ready, once we secure the money for the power, of course. Graves gives a lecture at the Astronomia Modernis Lecture Hall, which is Latin for Modern Astronomy. This series is loaded with references to ancient Rome and mythology, as we will see. Graves delivers an argument for moon travel using the Graves equation and other scientific methods, while his counterpart argues against moon travel using alien attack and some sort of cheese example. I just couldn't love the three-eyed alien more. The audience gives a resounding applause for Graves. like It's like they are elevating the unquestioned triumph of science and making the other views like religion or mythology to be embarrassingly inept. Then speculative questions from the reporters via the mayor, who's played by Neil DeGrade's father. They express concerns over the dependency on Graves for electricity and when the mysterious tower will be unveiled an echo from the prologue when the moon girl unveils her power to return to the moon. This group moves to the treasure of Plutus. We see a cornucopia in the window, which is tied to the myth of the Capricorn. The horn of the sea goat Amalthea broke off and transformed into the cornucopia or horn of plenty. Plutus, this ties with Plutus, the god of wealth, Greek mythology, of course, uh, who bears the cornucopia. Now, in the story of Dante, Plutus guards the circle of hell called the Hoarders and Wasters, an important detail for later on. It's here that we meet the bankers, Lucretius and Prudentin. Lucretius was a Roman philosopher and Augustine poet who came up with atomism, which establishes that the world is guided by fortune or chance, not the gods. His idea grew into modern evolution and materialism. Pru is short for prudence, the virtue of good judgment and cautiousness. I love these characters. They are a cool collection of opposites. Black, white, clothing, tall and short stature, cautious and impulsive temperaments. Uh, and just the way that they interact is so enjoyable. It's like they are the light side and dark side of the moon, if you will. Graves leverages the Capricorn scale as earnest or collateral to secure the largest loan in the history of the world. 
Graves signs the document and receives a big check. Note the check number is 122227. That is December 22nd, 1927, which was the first day of the winter solstice that year, the darkest day of the year and beginning of the sign of the Capricorn. If you know anything more details about this date or uh, horoscope and astrology or history of the Capricorn, make sure to drop it in the comment section below. After securing the deal, Graves is haunted by flashing images of the mysterious girl of the moon. The episode ends with the song, Episode 3, Decent, Descent, Descent. Like a fourth grade English homonym exercise, isn't it? <laughs> the group moves to Le Apogee Grandiose Hotel. Apogee, which is defined as the highest point in the development of something, it's the climax. Uh, and it also has a definition as the point in the orbit of the moon at which it is furthest from the earth. Uh, it also has pictures of the world-class Champagne, uh, Moet, and Chandon, an image of high-class luxury. Freya arrives having dressed elegantly for the occasion as the song lyrics sing, but if you arrive with no one by your side, who's going to hold you down? Christmas tree is in the background with a bright light at the top, perhaps a symbol of hope during the darkest of times. To the others, Freya is quite the attractive spectacle Freya gives Graves that look. She obviously holds more than a professional interest, but to Graves, he barely acknowledges she's there. Graves excuses himself early to sulk on the balcony and look fondly at his tower, perhaps to the context within the tower that will take him back to the moon and his love of his youth. He leaves Freya disheartened. She didn't come for the party, she came for him. Lucretius and McTavish make a descent to the lower levels, despite the cautious pleas from Prue to the contrary. Oh, poor Prue. They bring up that which is from below, skull-branded beverages and a band of musicians, the elements of decadence and debauchery. Graves sees the moon illuminate and sends some sort of moonbeam into the building of the apogee, like the queen of the night is enchanting the spirits of darkness or something. The alcohol bottles glow, the faces beam with light like the girl from episode one. The song Enchanté sings, if we can't raise the dead, we'll raise hell instead. If they won't engage in the higher spiritual meaning, they will settle for giving themselves to lower spiritual engagement. Uh, for more of a deep dive into that song, check out the conversation between Neil DeGrade and Jonathan Peugeot, making of the myth on the Dirt Poor Robins YouTube channel. The people at the party indulge in their cravings. As the song says, my hunger is the rule I cannot overturn. The city is powered with electric light throughout, or through the false or artificial light. The grid is in the shape of, of a web. It's as if the whole society is caught in a spider's web that leads to death. They discard their archaic forms of natural light for the new free electricity. Just like Young Graves loses his lantern and receives the illuminated Capricorn scale in episode one, and Graves is quite pleased with himself and the developments. The rest of the episode is a descent into decadence and debauchery. The people grow into a mob, making a mockery of poor Prue. By the end, they are literally mounting prudence into the submission of their will for lustful banality. Freya seems to anticipate what is coming and grieves what's ahead. She tells Graves that his father is dying and the power for Graves' personal project is ready. Episode 4, Unearthly. Oliver Graves goes to St. Camillus Hospital to see his father. St. Camillus de Lelis <laughs> devoted his life to care for the sick. The patron, he's also the patron saint of hospitals. Graves has last, his last conversation with his father, and we see echoes, echoes of episode 1. There's music from the grave scene that's playing in the background. Uh, there's the the symbols of the bed and the chair. However, the roles are reversed. The father is now in the bed about to race, about to rest, and the son is saying good night and asking questions of how he's going to make it through this time. His father makes him promise that to find a wife, all of this is meaningless without an heir. 
And there's this cool dialogue. I have a girl in mind. What's she like? The father asked. Unearthly. That's what I said about your mother. And what does this mean? Was Oliver's mother a mysterious lady from the moon? Or was it just that she was an extraordinary woman? There's a really cool play on this word, unearthly, here. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm curious. Graves' electric devices are keeping his father alive, and then they short-circuit, displaying the limits and dangers of the dependency upon technology. The moon girl appears again, haunting Graves with distorted images. So he returns to Grave Tower, climbs down a secret passage to his secret rocket ship. The deeper plan is now revealed. Graves Tower was really a launch pad for his rocket, as the plans in Episode 2 revealed. The power that was purchased via debt to Pluto's bank is siphoned from the city and the people in order to fuel his rocket ship so Graves can fly to the moon. He leaves a wake of destruction and disappointment in below, selfishly pursuing the girl of his dreams at the cost of everyone else. Graves has a moment of regret for exploiting and harming his friends, but he quickly turns and prepares for his landing on the moon in long-awaited reunion with the Queen of the Night. He walks the moon with an old deep sea diving helmet, which is this cool symbolism of the deep with the sky and how the technology of one is very similar to the other. Uh, he sees a white flower or a collection of white flowers that the moon girl was picking in episode one. He takes it as a sign of a healthy atmosphere, so he removes his helmet. He's bid by the apparition of the moon girl to enter through the gates guarded by winged lion statues, which are most likely griffins or perhaps the heraldic symbol of St. Mark. Okay, so here's my quick analysis. I'll be getting into more of a detailed one after the release of episode 5, but here are a few notes before we discuss predictions for the finale. There's the use and misuse of technology in these episodes. Which brings up the paradox that the more technology strengthens us, the weaker we actually become. And there's this also the illusion or the, the, the temptation of convenience and the dangers of debauchery. Uh, are we witnessing the fall of the Tower of Babel? There's this attempt to elevate reality with the power of technology only to see it come crashing down over us? Oh. We'll have to find out in the last episode. And there's also the symbols of the brooches that I noticed where there's the, the brooch that has the wings on Freya. Perhaps this is a symbol that she's representing hope, the possibility of a restoration of things. And of course, Oliver Graves has the, the spider uh, brooch. And it's perhaps it's symbolic of the web-shaped electric grid that he created uh, or what we know about spiders is that they're dangerous creatures who capture prey with hidden traps and sucks their blood at, the, at a convenient time for its own nourishment. We could possibly see the unveiling of this symbolism in the finale. Okay, the predictions or what to look out for in the last episode. We see that there's this image that Derpore Robbins posted on their website of a sea goat. There's this the triumph of a sun god over the agent of darkness. And we see the, the tail of a sea creature and the head of the goat. Uh, tying back, this could be the ancient Roman depiction or perhaps like the St. George slaying of the dragon. Uh, I, what is in store for Mr. Graves is my question after showing that. There's also an image that they posted of the cast of actors revealing the long-anticipated appearance of none other than Kate DeGrade, the other half of the husband-wife duo that is Dirtpoor Robbins, the makers of the series. So who is the, the true queen of the night? Well, the release of the episode 5 teaser trailer confirms that Kate is sitting atop a throne on the moon, so most likely it has to be Kate. I mean, it was what we were expecting for people that follow Dirtpoor Robbins. It, has, it, it's, it was just meant to be Kate. Uh, so how is she going to receive Mr. Graves and his rocket ship? Well, if the YouTube thumbnail for the teaser or for, for the premiere episode is in the indication, doesn't look like things go so well for Mr. Graves. But we will have to find out. 
Again, I have a, a conversation or two lining up where we can, um, I'm bringing in some other thinkers and people that have some experience with Roman history and symbolism, uh, as well as uh, Gareth Boyd, who has experience and has written articles on the Golden Key, which is so reminiscent and so pertinent to the Queen of the Night. And I have a couple other videos that I'll be posting, one on after episode five, and then a wrap up analysis covering more of the themes as they play out and, and interact with each other. So more to come. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to check out the premiere of the finale. Uh, I hope to see you there in the live chat and the discussion with the Dirt Poor Robins uh, Discord that you can get a, a passcode through their, uh, their Patreon, I believe. So I hope to see you there. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section below. And until the next video. Thank you.